speaking as they were singing that song. When my car came to a stop on Wednesday, I heard myself saying, Jesus, Jesus, over and over again. I am so glad he's my go-to in the midst of trouble when I cannot think of anything else to do. He is who I go to. Amen? Amen. Thank you, praise team. This is our mixed praise team, our young adult praise team. Weren't they wonderful? Amen. Thank you for your obedience tonight. Amen. Amen. Ladies, you can be seated. We are so very, very happy to bring back Jamie this year. She and her husband passed her in Alabama, in Birmingham, and I'm sure she's going to tell you more about that, but uh, she is a powerful, powerful woman of God, and I, most of you already know that. And so we are in for a wonderful weekend, two services, listening to her bring the word to us. So let's give her our attention as she comes back. Can we thank Linda for putting this evening, this weekend together for us? I know, listen girls, this takes a lot of work to put something like this together. Thank you, Linda. And I'm telling you, what sacrifice after a car accident like what she went through and to be here. That tells me she loves God and she loves you. And we thank God for you, Linda. Well, it's good to see you. How many of you were here last year? Wow, so there were quite a few of you. This, how many of you have never heard um, me speak before? Let me see your hands. What? Wow, this is fun. How many pastor's wives do we have? I saw Cindy. Cindy, I think that's right. Isn't that your name, Cindy? Can you stand? I give honor to all of our leaders tonight. Is, is there any other pastor's wives or pastors in the room? Let's have you stand. Woo. What? Wow, this is awesome. Wait, no, I want you girls to continue standing for just a moment. Would you all just stand? All of you. Now, this is what I want us to do. I want us to give honor to these dynamic women of God. And I want you to turn around and tell them how much you appreciate them. Let these women know how much you appreciate them. All of your service. Come on, ladies. Would you say something to them? We do appreciate you so very much. Well, let me tell you a little bit about the resource table in the back as you're leaving. Um, last year, I preached two messages. If you were here, you will remember I preached on the spirit of Sheba. And then I preached a message on breakthrough. I preached about unlocked and unblocked. And I've got those CDs, and I uh, maybe you didn't get to make it last year. There was quite a few of you not able to be here. I would encourage you to go by and pick those up. All CDs are $5 or 3 for $12. Um, and then um, I served on the board of directors for Penal Drug and Ac Alcohol Rehabilitation Center there in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Woo, y'all know about that place. And, of course, if you know about that place, you know that Dr. Marion Spellman has done an incredible job with that uh, ministry, with that work. And she wrote a wonderful book. Um, it's actually the story about Penile. And so when you purchase this book, it goes to, those proceeds go to help Penile. And also, I wrote a book. It's my own personal testimony. It's called Like a Vapor, Life is Too Short to Live a Lie. How many of you have read my book before? Let me see your hand if you've read my book. Oh! <gasps> Where have you been? <laughs> How many of you have ever heard my testimony? Let me see your hands. Not even very many of you have heard my story. Wow. Well, let me encourage you to go back and pick up the book. If you buy it on Amazon, you pay $15 plus shipping. You get it here, it's $12. Um, I, was, I was raised in addiction. My parents struggled primarily with alcoholism, but other drugs as well. But they were bingers, so they would binge for days at a time and leave me and my siblings for days at a time, a lot of neglect. Um, but I grew up in that atmosphere, and by the time I was 13, I was suffering with su uh, what was called major depression. And at the age of 15, I have suffered a complete mental breakdown. It's my story of what got me to such a broken place. It was the lies that I continued to buy into, the lie that was lived before me that I continued to believe and agree with. 
and it took me to a very broken place. But the second half of the book talks about the truth that set me free. How many of you have ever experienced that? Truth that redeems and sets free. Perry and Pam Stone wrote the foreword to that book. It's such an easy read. I've had quite a few people say, you know, I read it in three days, or I sat down and read it in two days. And, hey, a 10-year-old in Sylacauga, Alabama, he's read it three times. Or now he's probably 12. He's read it three times now. So uh, if he can read it, I'm sure you can, even if you say you're not a reader. But if you've ever, if you've got anyone in your family struggling with addiction or mental illness or abuse, because there was a lot of abuse in our home, um, I would encourage you to pick up the book and just speak some hope to them and encourage them. Go by, visit the table. Denise, where are you? Denise is the one you will see, and uh, she's the person that, she's such a blessing. Would you tell Denise thank you? I mean, she's volunteered to help me out. I appreciate that. Well, can I just give a little bit of a testimony before I get into the Word tonight? I love to testify. How many of you love testimonies? Anybody besides me? And I do want to give honor to Pastor or Bishop Phillips. I know he is not with us tonight, but I do thank him and all of the Phillips family and the work they're doing here. And we appreciate this opportunity just to be here in this ministry, be a part of it. And Ju Judy and Lane Sargent would hurt me if I didn't say hello and how much they love you. They love you so much. But let me give a little bit of testimony. A few uh, weeks back, I was speaking at the South Carolina State um, Pentecostal Holiness Convention. Or maybe it was Congregational Holiness. It was one of those. I was speaking at the, uh, their state convention. And uh, as I was up, I heard the Lord say, there is a, a woman, there's a leader present who is suffering with an illness that even those closest to her don't know how bad it really is. And and I sensed, I knew that this was going to be the night of her healing. I just knew it. And so, lo and behold, there was a pastor's wife. And her and her husband were uh, strong leaders in the denomination. And she came forward, and, and she was in her late 30s. She was weeping so uncontrollably. Nobody knew, but she was now suffering her second, second round with cancer. She, she had had cancer in her past, but it had come back, and it had come back with a vengeance. And it, it, was, uh, it was a very scary moment in time for her as she was facing uncertainty, but people in her congregation, no, no, people that were closest to her didn't know how bad it was. But when I went to pray for her, I felt the travail of Holy Spirit. It was one of those moments, Holy Spirit, even he was grieved by the attack on the woman of God. Even the Holy Spirit was grieved by what this woman was going through. And it was one of those moments that you knew something was happening. And, and I got home, it was about two weeks after the conference, and I got a text from the state director, and she said, I don't know if you remember the woman you prayed for the pastor's wife. She Here she was, she had never had children, she was in her late 30s, the diagnosis was not good. The prognosis was not good for her. But she went back to the doctor. Not only was she completely healed of female cancer, but the doctor told her, there's no reason why you can't have children. Now that's a miracle, folks. That's a miracle when the doctors have said it ain't looking good and then the cancer's gone. And not only that, but she's going to be able to have children. That's a miracle. That's the kind of Jesus we serve. Would you stand up and praise him? That's the kind of Jesus we serve. He's a miracle worker. Woo, hallelujah. Shoo, praise you, Lord. Oh, just remain standing. I, I, let me tell you one more. At our church just a few weeks ago on a Sunday morning, a man, um, a Nigerian had from Atlanta. We used to pastor in Atlanta for 18 years before we went to uh, Birmingham a, a year ago. But a man drove all the way from the Atlanta area on Sunday morning. He had a severe stuttering problem, so severe that it had gotten him fired from his job. 
He said it, it, it was crippling his life. He showed up to church that morning believing that God was going to heal him. Honey, when he grabbed that microphone, he started declaring healing and preaching. The Lord completely healed him of stuttering. Now, the Lord is a healer, folks. He is a healer. And if you need healing, tonight is your night. Tonight is your night if you need healing. Holy Spirit, hallelujah, thank you. What a powerful name it is. Sing it again. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. Sing it loud. What a powerful compares powerful name it is the name of G sing it again what a power what a powerful name it is what a powerful name hands lifted declare the name of Jesus Christ my king what a powerful name it is nothing compares to this what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Say it. Again, what a, what a powerful name it is, the name. Now, would you put your hands together and shout, Jesus. Jesus. Woo. Yes. Praise you, God. Just remain standing and take your Bible and go with me to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 23. 1 Samuel chapter 23. I'm going to read this out of the New King James Version of the Bible. You can read it out of the translation that you brought with you or read it from your phone or whatever device you have. 1 Samuel chapter 23. Just stay with me just a minute longer. Beginning with verse 1. This is just somewhere God has had me so strongly. I don't know about you, but this just speaks to me. Then they told David, saying, look, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah. And they are robbing the threshing floors. Everyone say threshing floors. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, Go and attack the Philistines and save Keilah. But David's men said to him, Look, we are afraid here in Judah. How much more than if we go to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? We're afraid here where God is. How much more scary is it if we have to go out there where the enemy is? Hmm. Then David inquired of the Lord once again. And the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into your hand. And David and his men went to Keilah. And they fought with the Philistines, struck them with a mighty blow, and took away their livestock. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. For the next few minutes, I want to talk to you on the subject, the battle at the threshing floor. The battle at the threshing floor. How many of you know what it is to be in a battle? Anybody besides me know what it feels like to be in a fight, to be in a battle? I want you to put your Bible down and take the hand of the person standing next to you. This is called touching and agreeing prayer. And I just want you to pray because you have no idea. You may have, I don't know, you may have rode together tonight in a car with that person, but you really don't know the depths of what they've been experiencing and maybe what it even took for them to get here. So right now, I want you to pray for them out of the depths of your own spirit right now and ask God to speak to your sister, 
to minister to her tonight. That God would reveal himself to her in a mighty way. Father, we just lift up one another. We pray for one another, God. We want an encounter, God. We need an encounter with you tonight. We invite you to speak to us, God. I ask you, Lord, to speak to all my sisters here tonight. I ask you to reveal things that they need have revealed, Father, to speak, God, in ways they need to hear your voice, God, to show them, Lord, how much you love them in a new and fresh way tonight, to let them know they are not alone tonight, to encourage somebody to keep trusting, to keep trusting, to hang in there, God, to let someone know you see them, you see them tonight, Father. I praise you in advance for what you're going to do in this house. I praise you in advance for what you're going to do in the ladies' lives tonight. What you're going to do in families tonight, God. We praise you in advance for the miracles that are going to come out of this time that we share in the Word. And this time we share in the Spirit, Father. And we give you all the glory in advance for what you will do because we ask it in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said... Amen. Amen. Now, before you're seated, get out of your seat. Go to at least three women, hug them really good and tight, and say, I'm so glad you showed up tonight. I'm so glad you showed up tonight. I know it was a fight, but I'm glad you showed up. That builds strength. Fellowship does. I love it. I love to hear the fellowship. You know, some of the sweetest things in life can only be found in the most difficult of places. It's when we're facing battle that we tend to look around as if we're in it all alone. But if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to be reminded tonight that God is for you. Hallelujah. He is for you. He is for your growth. He is for your joy. He is for your success. He is for your victory, and he's going to use the struggle that you are facing tonight as a delivery agent for a better life. He's placed treasure in the middle of your battlefield. The spoils of your win are waiting on your arrival tonight. I can tell you from experience that on good days or on bad days when I if I'm at peace or if I'm at war if I'm sick or whether I'm healthy he's the God who always brings beauty out of every battle I go into someone needs to know tonight you're not getting weaker you're getting stronger as believer you're not going to faint you're not going to get weary you're going to rise you're going to soar and you're going to reap the blessing of victory that's God's method. Would you praise him? Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. Touch somebody and say, we're unstoppable. Tell somebody, we're unstoppable. Every hero of the faith was tested, trained, and made stronger through the time they spent on the battlefield. That's how they got stronger. And that great company 
that great cloud of witnesses. They're teaching us something tonight. They're letting us know, yes, war is hard, but God is good, and God is faithful, and you can always trust him. Oh, come on, somebody. Help me preach this tonight. God wants you to know that he's already been to every minute that you will ever, ever face. He's already been there. He's already been to your future and back. He's already built provisions into every minute when you need it. You may not can see it right now. You may not can touch it right now. But when you get there, it's going to be waiting on you. That's why you can face your fight tonight with faith. You can walk off of your back battlefield more alive than you've ever been before you can walk out of that battle more radiant than you were when you went in you can walk off that battlefield with victory and not defeat come on and help me preach it if you know it help me preach it mm. when you read through the bible there are several things that we notice concerning threshing floors it's interesting because in the text that I read to you, we see that the Philistines just kept attacking and kept attacking the Israelites and stealing from them every time they got to the threshing floor, Kila. Now, you've got to understand what was happening. Every time they would show up with the bounty of the blessing of their labor, the enemy would show up to rob from them. Now, Keilah, you've got to understand, was a city in Judah. Judah means praise. Isn't that interesting? Judah means praise. Keilah was a city in the city or the place of praise. Keilah was known as a strong fortress. Yet this very place, that this place of strength, this place of praise was where the enemy kept showing up. It was at the place of strength that the enemy would show up and rob and steal from them and continually take from them. Every time the blessing would hit the threshing floor, here came the enemy to steal and to kill and to take from the people of God. Now, when you read through the Bible, you will see that a threshing floor had a two primary uses. There were two primary reasons or meanings in a threshing floor. One was that of blessing, that of blessing, which represented, or as we see it, it's, it's, it's where the external battling occurs. It's the place where external enemies attack, blessing, external warfare. But the other meaning of a threshing floor was that of purging, of separating, which is a picture of internal warfare, internal battle. So the, the threshing floor is a picture of external battling and internal battling, which is interesting because the, the threshing floor, according to several places in Scripture, we know was noted for place of blessing. Matter of fact, if, if you want to make note of some scriptures, Numbers chapter 18 verse 30 talks about the increase of the threshing floor. Joel chapter 2 verse 24 talks about the floors shall be full of wheat. It's, it's a picture of blessing. But here was the enemy stealing at the point of blessing. Now, why do I say that? Because the Lord took me and it showed me something so significant concerning and prophetic concerning the season and the hour that we are in as the people of God. He took me to a passage that continually this year I keep getting greater revelation out of this scripture. And it's found in Zechariah chapter 11 and verse 7. And I don't know, they do have it, I think. Chapter 11 and verse 7. And I, and I want you to note this scripture because this is what God showed me. God said, this is where my people are. This is
is a prophetic scripture concerning our time and the season that we are presently engaging. This is where many of you will find yourself. Because listen to what God said. Now God is prophesying here. And God said, so I, God is speaking of himself. So I shepherded the flock, marked for slaughter, particularly the oppressed of the flock. Then God says, I took two staffs and one I call favor. Everyone shout favor. That's blessing. Your, your translation might even say blessing. Uh, one I called favor or blessing. And the other I called union or unity. Everyone shout unity. So he said, I took two staffs and I shepherded my flock. I shepherded them by using a guiding tool. A, a staff was a way to direct the sheep. It, it gave them a, a way to go. It showed them where to go. It would lead and guide the sheep. And he said, I, I, I was, I'm leading you somewhere. I'm trying to take you somewhere right now. I, I'm trying to bring you into something right now. I'm trying to guide you in two ways. Now you're going to see who God is speaking through when he gives this prophecy. Because he gives it through a man by the name of Zechariah. Zechariah was the grandson of Edo the priest. He was a Levite. A Levite. And Zechariah grew up uh, with a godly uh, uh, heritage. He was a, a descendant of a Levite. But he was born in captivity. Zechariah was born in Babylon. Babylon, we know, uh, was a picture of purging. It was a place that God sent Israel to purge them. To purge them of their sins. And so Zechariah grew up, he grew up in oppression. He grew up in captivity. This was all he ever knew was oppressive living and captive living. He never knew what freedom really felt like or what it was really all about because he grew up in captivity in Babylon. Don't you know that his grandfather would sit him down and talk to him about what it used to be like in Jerusalem? Don't you know that grandfather Edo would say, oh, I can remember the stories of how the glory would fill the temple. Oh, the stories of, oh, how the glory would come down and visit when the priest would minister. Don't you know his grandfather would tell him stories about what Israel looked like, how glorious it once was, how beautiful the temple of Solomon was. Don't you know he heard the stories? He never saw it, but he heard the stories. Don't you know that hearing that, he was anxious to see what he'd only heard about. He was anxious to look at what he'd heard stories told about, yet he had never seen it for himself. But he was among the first group, Zechariah, was among the first group of captives to journey back to Jerusalem to rebuild the city. Now, I want you just a moment to put yourself in the shoes of Zechariah because as he's journeying and traveling back, all the way back to Israel, he's anticipating. Have you ever heard about a place you haven't seen and you couldn't wait to see it with your own eyes? Have you heard of, ever heard about a visiting maybe a place on vacation and you would only heard the stories but you hadn't seen it for yourself and you couldn't wait to see it? Maybe you'd never been to Disney and you heard all about Disney. And you saw movies about Disney, but you couldn't wait to see it. And you were like a little kid, right, when you showed up and you saw.
saw it for the first time, and, and you were wide-eyed, right, trying to take it all in. I don't know, maybe you went, you want to go to Greece, and the first time you went to Greece, you were wide-eyed, and you were looking at everything. I don't know what that place is for you, but I want you to imagine that's what it was like for Zechariah. He was anticipating. He was looking forward to it. He couldn't wait to see the place his granddaddy told him all about, only to walk upon it. Think about it as he was uh, maybe uh, journeying on a camel. I don't know. But as he gets closer and closer, it's nothing what, what like what he had heard about. It doesn't look anything like he imagined. It, it's not beautiful. It's ugly. It, it, it's not a glorious place. It's a depressing place. It was nothing like what he thought. And I can imagine as he was looking, tears coming down his face, looking at a place that was disappointing. Have you ever had your hopes up and was greatly disappointed? Your, your, your level of disappointment was so, so shattering that it brought tears to your eyes because that's what was going on with Zechariah. He looks and he's disappointed and tears are coming down his cheeks when God begins to give to him a prophecy. And it's a word of hope. It's a word of restoration. And God says to the man of God, so Zechariah, so, Zechariah, look what I'm going to do. I'm going to shepherd this flock, the one that was marked for slaughter, the very ones, particularly the scripture says, that are oppressed among the flock, those that the enemy set his mind to kill, those that the enemy set a target to destroy. I'm particularly going to shepherd them. I'm particularly going to take care of those that were marked for oppression by the devil. God was saying, you better not mess with my children. You better not mess with what belongs to me. Watch what I'm about to do. Watch what I'm about to show you. Because now I'm taking two staffs. And I'm taking my rod and my staff. And I'm leading my people in the way of favor. I know you don't look favored right now. But I promise you, you are favored. I know you don't feel favored right now. But I promise you, you are are favored. I'm leading you there. Would you praise him? Look at someone and tell them you are favored. Look at the person on the other side and tell them, girl, you are favored. Receive that. Somebody needs to be convinced tonight that you are favored because your circumstances don't look like your favor. Your circumstances aren't saying you are favored. But I came from Birmingham, Alabama tonight to tell somebody you are being led by God in the way of favor. Oh. And God said to me, you, my people, that is, God was speaking to me. He said, my people, you are coming into, and this may mean nothing to you, but it meant so much to me. God said, I am bringing my people into a just because season of favor. Just because season of favor. I said, what? What do you mean, God? Explain that to me. Just because. In other words, Jamie, they didn't earn it. They didn't pray hard hard enough for it. They didn't have enough money to buy it. They didn't know the right people to get them there. It's just because I'm choosing to favor them in this season. It's bigger than they know. Hallelujah. 
I'll give you, I heard somebody say, give me some scripture for that. I'll give you some scripture for that. It was a just because season of favor for a woman by the name of Esther. You know her story. She was a the queen there in Persia. She was a Jew. Nobody knew it, but she was a Jew. Yet the people, her people, the people of God were being set up as a target once again. The enemy was coming after the people of God. And Mordecai says to her, her cousin says, you got to go in and you got to plead our case with the king. You got to say to the king something to spare the lives of your family. She said, well, I, I can't because the king hasn't called for me in a while. And in that day when the king didn't call for you and you showed up, you were dead. And she said, I can't. He hasn't asked for me in a while. I, I don't know. I, I don't think I can do that. He said, don't you know you are there. Maybe that's the whole reason why God put you there. Don't you understand that favor that is on you has nothing to do with just you? Don't you understand that favor has more to do with us? It's bigger than you. It's for a nation. It's for a group of people. Don't you understand what that favor's about? It's not about making you look good or making you rich or making you pretty. That favor is about the people of God and what he's about to do. Oh, come on and praise him. And you know the story. She goes into the king's court. He extends the scepter of favor to her. When he extends the scepter of favor, he says, what do you want, baby? Up to half of the kingdom. Whatever you want, it's yours. And God showed me this. He said, I'm telling you, my people are entering a season of just because favor. Oh! I want you to see this. It's because God is upset with the way the enemy has been oppressing you. God is upset with the way the enemy has attacked your family. God is angry with the way the enemy came against your business. God is upset with the way the enemy has come against your church. And just because the enemy touched something that was precious to God, he says, I'm going to favor you and show the devil who's boss. Hallelujah. It was a just because season of favor when a man was a lame man was laid out at the pool of Beth Bethsaida. You know the story. He'd been there for, for 38 years. He'd been crippled. And every year he would go to the pool hoping that as the angel would come once a year to stir the water every year. He was waiting for his turn. When is it going to be my turn? When is it going to be my turn? Every year it looked like he was not the favored one. Every year he was bypassed. But for 30 38 years he kept showing up hoping it, maybe today maybe it's my turn maybe this time I'll be the one who's favored and yet nobody would give him the time of day until Jesus the son of God showed up and Jesus looked at him and he said to him today it's your day just because I just I just choose you just because today it's your turn and somebody needs to know that tonight. It has nothing to do with the amount of prayer you prayed, how much you fasted, or anything that we could do at this season in, the, in time. This has everything to do with a prophetic cycle, a prophetic season that we are in. And God is choosing to guide us in favor. Would you praise him for that? Would you thank him for favor on your life? Would you thank him for favor on your life? Even if you can't see it, thank him. Even if you don't believe it right now, thank him. Woo! Hallelujah. Jesus, you got to see this, what the Lord is doing. He took me to this passage in Zechariah, and he said, I am leading my people this direction in this hour. And there's a reason why I'm doing this. You know, too often we want to equate with the, the blessings of God, with a thing that we earn. We have to earn it. 
and we negate the whole idea of grace because it has everything to do with grace. And God in his gracious love is so eager to show the devil how favored his children are. I don't know how he tried to harm. I don't know how he tried to oppress. I don't know what he did, what he has done, what the enemy has tried to do to you. But I'm here to speak a word of encouragement and life over you. That God is using his, his, his staff, his, his method of leading you. Right now he's nudging you. And you're feeling this. Oh, what's this about, God? He's trying to nudge you in a direction. He's trying to show you, I'm pushing you this way. Because this way is where just because meets you. This way is where favor is going to adorn you. This way is where people are going to marvel and say, that has to be God. That has to be God. God is choosing to do this. But you got to believe it. If you believe it, say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. The threshing floor was not only a place of blessing, but it was also a place of separation. A place of separation. And the process was this. It, it, was, it, it, it was simply this. They, they would go out to a field where grain was growing. Now imagine this, the grain is out there growing in this field, it's, it's surrounded by people, or, or, or grain just like it, you know, and it's happy because it's getting all the water it needs, it's getting, it's getting all the attention it needs, it's getting all the sunshine it wants, it's getting everything it needs to grow, and, and it's content in this place. But then somebody comes and says it's time to harvest. And somebody comes in and yanks that grain right up and takes it down to the threshing floor. And at that threshing floor, it begins this very harsh process. It was brutal because they would take the grain and they would begin to beat it against bricks until the stalk was separated from the grain. They would take the head of that grain, and then they would take a winnowing fan. A winnowing fan was much like a, a pitchfork, uh, but they would, they would begin to rake it. It was a very violent part of the process, raking it over the head of that grain, the stalk being separated, but the grain, the, the fruit of it, and they're, they're raking it through this, but they're, they're not finished after this violent, brutal part. Then they take what is still remaining, and they, they place it in this garment kind of thing, and they would begin to throw it into the air, that while it was thrown into the air, the wind would catch it, and then there would be this separation between the chaff and the grain, but they would throw it up over and over until there was this distinct separation. And the chaff was definitely separated from the fruit or the grain. And then they had something they could work with. Then they had something that was edible. Then they had something they could use. And, and, and it doesn't take a, a theologian to catch the metaphor here. Because many of you, this is exactly where you are. Hear me, I know it. You came tonight, and you that's you tonight. You are that grain that's been growing out in, in, in a pleasant place for a while. The Lord's had you there. You were growing. Uh, you were around like-minded people. You were around people who, who encouraged you. You were around people who strengthened you. And, and every time, you know, we get together, we like, what, we like being hanging out together, don't we? We like these kind of meetings. It's just so fun. And, oh, we just, oh, we have a good old time, right? Hallelujah, hallelujah. And we have so much fun. But, but oh, God says, mm, 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 mm. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Because you can't stay here and feed people. You can't remain here and help anybody. You may look good from a distance. It may seem beautiful. 
but you aren't helping anybody. And so God takes us out of the place where we've just been nurtured and growing and fed and, and feeling so confident and good about ourselves. And he yanks us out of that place and he takes us down to his threshing floor. And as threshing floor, he begins that process. Ooh, this is a brutal pro I don't know if you've ever had God take you through this. Where you can, it feels like every part of you is being ripped and torn apart your insides. This is the internal battle that some of you are in. Some of you have been going through external battling, but there are many of you in, in this room. This is you tonight. You've been going through an internal battle that many in this room don't even know what you feel what you've been experiencing and yet God is the one who's been allowing this and he's allowed this pressure in this breaking process but then he's not done with you because then he allows the winnowing fan of his spirit I don't know if you've ever had the Holy Spirit rake you over honey if you've ever had Holy Ghost just rake your insides oh and tell you he loves you while he's doing it I don't know if you've ever had the Holy Ghost do that but where he's raking you over and he's dealing with things you see because that 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 uh, that chaff was helpful when I was growing out there when I was growing out there the chaff kept me protected the chaff helped me to stay protected in vulnerable situations and, and I liked it because it, it made me feel safe but the chaff was also keeping some things from getting to me it was keeping me from getting where I needed to go and so God said I can't do anything with you like that I've got to take you through this process and the Lord takes you through the winnowing fan experience but he's not done because I don't know if you've ever had God take you and allow his uh, hurricane force winds that's the only way I can explain it hurricane force winds and he just allows the wind to just totally totally tear apart anything left anything left it's like the Lord is ripping it apart and tearing it from you and you're wondering God why would you allow such a thing God why and he's saying because I love you because I love you and you keep saying I want to do this for you Jesus I want to do that for you Lord but don't you know you haven't been able to feed anybody because you've not allowed me to deal with some things that got to be deal dealt with in your life I've got to deal with some things that are keeping me from getting to you things that you, walls that you constructed that you thought were keeping her, her out but are keeping me out in the process and I'm dealing with you over these things and God is allowing many of you to go through this whole separation you know this the the signs and things we see going on in the natural those things those are indicators of things going on in the spirit do you understand what I'm saying things going on in the natural realm are indications of things that are happening in the spiritual realm this year we have seen uh, uh, hurricanes on a level that we haven't seen in so many years. What about the fires? The fires in California. What about the eclipse? What the things we've been seeing, it's as if heaven and earth is shouting at the church, wake up, wake up, wake up. Heaven and earth is shouting at the church. Come on, bride. You gotta be spotless. You gotta be ready when the king comes back. You gotta be ready when the bridegroom comes back. And God is dealing with these things because he knows what he wants to do through us. He knows what he is ready to do through you. He knows what he's eager to do in your family, what he's eager to do in your life. And so he's got to get rid of some things in the process. He's allowing hurricane winds to blow through your life because he loves you. I talked with a woman just a, a couple, few weeks ago, 75 years old, 75 years old. She began to tell me her story she told me how that she grew up and at the age of six her father abandoned her and her mother totally walked out on her mother and abandoned her 
at the age of six. She was raised by a single mom. She said, I, my whole life I worked to prove I was an overachiever. I worked to prove that I was somebody worth loving. My whole life I worked to prove that I was a smart woman, that I was a strong woman. I excelled at everything I did. She went on, she won all kind of beauty pageants. She ended up working for the governor of the state of Alabama for many years. She was a, a very a strong, confident uh, woman. When you would look at her, very confident and beautiful woman. But all those years working so hard to prove, she's also one of the most mighty prayer warriors you'll ever meet. She had a prayer, a, a war room before the movie ever came out, okay? She had a war room built on her house years ago, and it's her prayer closet. And she was a praying woman, loved the Lord. But a few years ago, her daughter said, Mama, I want to meet my biological grandfather. I want to meet him. And she said, I, I kept putting her off and putting her off. And she said, my daughter was so insistent. Let's find him. Let's find him. I want to meet him. So she said, I did the research. We found out he was living maybe an hour and a half from them. All those years, an hour and a half from where she lives. She said, I called. We made an appointment. We were going to drive up and spend the weekend with him and his new family. Because after he left her mother, he ended up marrying another woman. And he had several children with this other woman. She said, I had siblings I never knew I had. And so she said, my daughter and I got in the car. We drove up there. We get out of the car on that Friday. And she said, the whole family was out on the front lawn. She said, my father was a, a wealthy man. He had really done well for himself. And she said, my mother and I had struggled all those years. She said, and I looked. And he had done so well for himself. And she said, and, and all the, the, the kids and the grandchildren were out there. And she said, my daughter and I walk up. And they all begin to embrace us and hug us. She said, my father grabbed me and hugged me. She said, but I didn't feel anything. I couldn't feel anything. She said, I didn't feel anger. I didn't feel hurt. I didn't feel love. I felt nothing. She said, I, I thought, surely I should feel something. But I felt nothing. She said, well, that weekend we spent with him, I got to talk to him, got to know him. They got out the family picture albums, and I got to know my siblings, and they told stories. My dad talked to me about what had happened, and, and she said, I heard all this stuff, and she said, still, I, I just didn't feel anything. She said, but on the Sunday when we were getting ready to leave and, and go back, she said, my daughter said, can we all get in a circle and just pray before we leave? Can we pray together? And she said, we get in the circle. And she said, and I, and I, I join hands with my father. And she said, and when we start to pray, she said, something happened. She said, it was something happened on the inside of me. And she said, suddenly I realized I was angry at this man. Suddenly I realized I had had unforgiveness toward this man all these years. She said, I, all those years, I didn't even know, six, over 60 years. She said, I had heard sermons on unforgiveness. I had taught lessons on unforgiveness. I prayed for people who struggled with unforgiveness. But she said, it wasn't until that moment that God showed me. I had unforgiveness towards this man who had abandoned me and my mother. And she said the tears started to flow down my face. And I realized, is it possible that all the things I've gone through all these years was God trying to get my attention? It was God trying to say, examine your own heart. It was God trying to let me know all these years what had kept my family stuck. Maybe if I had heard him.
him. Maybe if I had seen him. She said, but that moment, something broke in on the inside of me, and I began to weep, and we had a healing moment. After that moment, she said, the heavens opened over my own family. To this day now, her children, they're all in church. Her granddaughters, they're all married in, in ministry, in full-time ministry. She said, I truly believe it was that moment when I realized that all these years what God had been trying to deal with me about and I was not willing to let him go there all these years God had allowed me to experience things to show it to me but that moment God brought healing to me and my children and my children's children oh praise God And could it be that God will allow things that we have to keep going through over and over? It's the same things over and over. We have to keep going through because God is trying to get our attention. And I'm speaking to us as individuals. I'm speaking to us as a church because just like the nation of Israel, they just couldn't get it either. God kept showing them, don't you know what keeps taking you into captivity? Don't you see what keeps causing? Yet that God would allow nation after nation to take them to a purging and a separating until they could finally wake up and see it. And I'm telling you, God is purging us. He's getting us ready because he is so ready to lead us into a season of such blessing, of such blessing, do you hear me? And unity. He's ready to take us there, but he's got to deal with some things that have been hindering us. Our perspective of battle has got to shift. We keep waiting for things to change. We keep saying, God, I'll believe it and I'll praise you for it when I see it, but it don't work that way. We got to sing the, to the promise before we ever hold the promise. You know what I'm saying? Have you ever had to sing towards something that you don't, don't quite hold yet? You got to sing. I, I say to my ladies, uh, sing, spring up, oh well. Even though there's no water, you may not even see water, but sing, spring up, oh well. Sing about it even before you hold it. Decree it before you ever have it. And the Lord is wanting us to make a declaration, a decree over the things that are going on in our lives that speak life. I had one of my prayer partners send me a message for you. And she said, I hear God saying to the people, the women of Ohio, do you trust me? Do you trust me? Do you trust me? Will you trust me in every situation? Will you trust me despite what you see? Will you trust me in spite of what you're going through? Do you trust me? God is speaking to hearts in this room right now. I'm going to ask somebody to come to the keyboard, and I'm going to ask everyone to stand up with me. Just stand to your feet. And I, I wanted to say some more things here, but I feel that the Lord wants me to end right here, and this is where I'm going to end. Because the scripture says this. Matter of fact, if you go back to verse 4, it says, David inquired of the Lord once again. Somebody needs to do that. God, here I am again. Here I am again. It's the same situation, God. Here I am. And God is saying, do you trust me? And the scripture goes on and says, And the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into your hand. God is saying, I'm going to deliver this enemy. I am going to deliver this enemy into your hands. I am going to deliver this enemy into your hands. Our sister said, Stand still. And see the salvation of the Lord. Stay, I'm going to deliver this enemy into your hand. And David and his men went to Keilah. The place of strength. In the city of praise. They fought. 
somebody needs to get their fight back. They fought. They fought. They struck the enemy with a mighty blow. A mighty blow. And they took away their livestock. They went and got back everything the enemy had stolen from them at the threshing floor. They took it away. And David saved the people. Who is it you're about to save? Who is it you're about to save? Who is it you're about to save? Because you're catching this tonight. Because you're understanding this. The scripture says they say that he saved the inhabitants of Keilah. God is a God of seed. We're a people of sensation. We keep waiting for a feeling, but God is looking for your faith. Sometimes you've got to believe it even if you don't feel it. Shoo, I'm talking to some people tonight. Sometimes you've got to speak it when you don't see it. Mm. Who is it you're fighting for? Who is it you're fighting for? My God. When my mother... When my mother... My mother was at her worst after my father's murder and my mother was staying drunk and God would say pray for her I would say God I don't want to pray for that woman don't make me pray for I'm called to that woman don't make me pray for that woman and he said see her deliver her set free I began to vision get a vision of her in the altar doing what she did when I was a little girl when she when I was a little girl and she first was introduced to Jesus I can remember I have memories of her in the altar and I had to get back to that place where I could see her like that again I had to see her like that again I began to rejoice and decree it. She's delivered. She's set free. She is healed. She's delivered. She's set free. She's healed. I had to, oh, I had to many times speak it by faith. Because when we put her in rehab and she, she left rehab and went straight to the club laughing, saying, I just got kicked out of the home of grace. She thought that was so funny getting kicked out of a place called the home of grace and the Lord said see it Jamie see it Jamie somebody needs to see it again David said okay God we can't see it but the Lord said again I don't know who I'm preaching to I know I'm preaching to some people that showed up and needed to hear this tonight. It's worth the fight. Somebody needs to know it is worth the fight. It is worth the fight. Don't stop fighting. Don't stop fighting. Don't stop fighting. Oh! Don't stop fighting for your marriage. Don't stop fighting for your children. Don't stop fighting for your ministry. Don't stop fighting for your church. Don't stop fighting. Oh! Hallelujah! But God 